so anyway, they asked me to come speak about entrepreneurship as a career because they finally recognized that it's a career choice. The choice of building uh, companies and starting them and creating them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell you guys a funny story. My first, uh, I'm going to mention my first company, but when I started my first company in the fall, I was working and my stepfather said, what are you working on? And I showed him what I was building. I'm going to show it to you guys in a minute. And then in December, somebody bought the company from me. They came and said, we love this. Can we buy it? So I started another one in January. So in February, my stepfather came back and he said, what are you working on? And I was building something else and I showed him. And he said, wait, I just asked you a couple months ago and you were doing something completely different. I said I was, and someone bought the whole company, so I started another one. You know what he said? My stepdad shook his head. I said, what? He said, this is going to look really bad on your resume. <laughs> and I was like, what part of, I'll probably never have a resume, right? It's confusing you. I sold the company. So he kept saying, well, it looks unstable. Well, every three years about when I started a company, somebody would buy it. So I guess I'm unstable and unhireable in, in their world. You guys have grown up in a world where entrepreneurship is something people understand, right? They, Here's one of the key things, investors, that I really want to share with you guys today. The cool part about doing this, and uh, there's no right or wrong, guys, right? I'm not telling you. Some people will go to work at jobs in big companies, some will go to work in little companies, and some of you will be entrepreneurs. None of those choices are wrong. This is a DNA thing, all right? It, it, we're just talking about the DNA of entrepreneurs and what this career is about. So I want to be clear about that. This isn't for everybody. But I'm going to tell you the benefits of it, because that's the place I come from. Um, the beauty of being an entrepreneur, it's not about business, it's not about money, it's not about the internet or tech. It's about getting to design the life that you want to live. Right? Entrepreneurs sit down and say, this is kind of what I want to do, so they go create that. And I'm going to go show you guys now some examples of that. I got into entrepreneurship because I didn't want to wait and see what the future held. I just wanted to design the future. I said, this is the life I want to live, and I'm just going to go make that happen, and I'm going to go design that. So I'm going to tell you my first one that, again, our whole premise here is entrepreneurs are people that design their future, right? So this is what I wanted to do. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in a little town in Arizona, and I grew up in a little desert town where nobody ever left and nobody ever went anywhere. And I'm not judging any of those people. That wasn't my plan. I had, like, big plans, big dreams. When we were in seventh grade, we had to read a Mark Twain book. And the Mark Twain book, we opened it up, and the first cover inside there was a quote from Mark Twain that basically said this. It said, travel is the fatal enemy of prejudice. And I remember reading that and thinking, man, if I could go see the world, I could understand the world, right? I would be a better person if I could literally go around the world and meet people that didn't look like me. I would dream that one day I'd go to an African village and sit in a family's home and have dinner. And that maybe then I'd go to a Muslim country and meet a family there and sit with them. Then I'd go down to South America and see how people live. That was my childhood dream. And I'll be honest with you guys, I got, my parents pressured me into getting a good job and a good company so I could get a good paycheck. So when I got out of college, I got an engineering job, and I'm just being honest with you guys, I didn't like my job. That doesn't mean you won't like yours, I just didn't like the company I worked for. And I was sitting in there in the cubicle one day thinking, I am never, nothing in my life, I'm never going to that. I said, before I die, for me to look back, someday I want to see the world, I want to visit 50 countries before. And I was thinking, I'm never going to do that. My job, I don't even go outside. I don't even go, I work on the fourth floor. I don't even go to the fifth floor. Right? I didn't see in much of the world, just the fourth floor. So I stopped and I said, you know what? I quit. My parents were really upset at me. Everybody was. Uh, but my goal, and I want you guys to think about what's yours. When you look back someday, for you to say, man, did I use my life well. I, I don't regret anything. I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. By the way, that's sort of my new definition of success. Because when we grow up, we believe that success is the combination of one, two, or three of these things. Money, power, or fame. Right? So people say, if, you're, if someone's rich, we call them successful. Yet I literally have billionaire friends who are miserable. If somebody's famous, we call them successful. But I have some very famous friends who are miserable. So it can't be that. And then I have some friends who have no money, no fame, no power, and love life every day. So I started thinking, the definition of success is if you look at your life and you turn and look back and say, I might have made some mistakes, but I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. I love my life the way it's going. That's your goal. That's the person you should be jealous of. And I started to notice that those are the people that did something about the stuff they said they were going to do with their life. So I'm sitting in my cubicle, and I said, well, my life would be great if before I die I make it to 50 countries, but I haven't even been to one. 
I don't have a job that ever leaves this building, and I'm doing nothing to make it happen. So I quit that job, became an entrepreneur. But here's what I want to tell you. There's a formula. Make, make a list of the things you want to do with your life. What are your dreams? What are your passions? What is your legacy? What do you want to look back one day and say, I did that while I was here on this planet? And you can start a company to do that. So I told you my first dream was when I quit my job, by the way, I, like I said, my parents, everybody was yelling at me. I had no job anymore. I was unemployed. No, my mom kept calling and saying, you need some food? And I was hungry, but I didn't want to say yes. Um, I was like, I'm okay, mom, I'll figure it out. So again, I wanted to see the world. So what's a good idea then? How about you start a company where you travel? If your goal in life is to see countries, then maybe you should start a company where your actual job is to go visit countries. So I'm going to show you guys my very first startup. After I quit that job, I was unemployed. Like I said, everyone's mad at me. I bought an airline ticket, which I didn't have money for, to go see a friend of mine who was kind of a mentor. He wasn't my parents or my family. He didn't judge me. He would just listen. But I went to the airport, and the line was really long. And it took an hour to get to check in. And when I got up to the front of the line, I missed the flight. And I was very upset because I can't afford to buy another ticket. And if you miss a flight, you pay all these penalties. When I got there, the woman's like, next. And she looks at my ID, and she gives me a boarding pass right, to get on the plane. And I said, I, I can't believe I stood in line for an hour, and all you did was hit print and give me a boarding pass. She's like, sir, you have to have a boarding pass to get on a plane. I said, ma'am, I understand that, but it's just a printer. You guys have all gotten a boarding pass, right? It's a piece of paper with a barcode. I said, why don't you why don't you stand here for an hour for you to use the printer? And she said, sir, you have to have a boarding pass. You can't get through security. I said, ma'am, I understand that. That's not my point. The point is, it's a printer, right? And we all stand in line, and you just hit print. And there's 100 people in line. This is ridiculous. And she's like, next. And I was like thinking, why don't you just put a printer over there and I'll print my own. And she said, only an airline can print a boarding pass. And I'm just going to tell you, that was my moment. So what you want to think about is, what is it you want to do with your life? I want to go see the world. And how can you create a company and create your own job? So at that moment, I was like, I got it. I know exactly what I'm going to do. So that Friday, I started my first company. And my first company, if you've ever been to the airport and used one of those, who's ever been to the airport and checked in on a kiosk? So we invented those. Uh, that was my first product. I went home and was like, I got an idea. What if I put a kiosk in the airport where everyone can get their own boarding pass? You know what happened? We built these things and we sold them literally all over the world. You know what my job was? My job was to go to a different country every single week to install one of these. I can tell you the first one because I got a phone call uh, from after we invented these things. It was KLM when we patented them. We started selling them. And it was KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. And I was like, oh, what can I help you with? I remember at the time, because I must not have paid attention in sixth grade geography. So I was like, Dutch, I know they're not German, that's Deutsch. And I was like, I don't think they're from Denmark, that's Danish. And the guy's like, we're from the Netherlands. I said, yeah, I knew that. Uh, he said, can you come to Holland? And I was like, are you kidding? That was on my list of 50 countries. It was number three. Like windmills and tulips and rivers. I want to go to Holland. And it was on my list. And the guy's like, could we fly you to Holland on us because we want to see your product? So my friends call, and I was like, I won't be home this week, and I'm going to Holland. When I got to Holland, the guy's like, you ever been to Holland before? And I was like, I've never been anywhere. I've never even been on the fifth floor of the building I work in. And he's like, do you have time to stay the weekend so we can show you our country? And I was like, you got to be kidding. I thought it was like on a prank show. I was like, you're joking, right? This is some kind of prank. Uh, he said, no, seriously. So my job then, by the way, when I'm getting ready to leave, I got to see Holland. And then at the end, he's like, oh, Mr. Hoffman, don't forget your check. And I was like, check? And he said, we want to buy these. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm getting paid to fly to a different country every week and see the country. This is like the coolest thing ever. That was my job, but it was my job because I created a company in the industry I wanted to be in that would give me a chance to have the life that I wanted. So we were installing these things literally all over. And I'm not, I am not, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I'll just show you guys, I'm not a money driven person. Uh, I don't, not that it's not important, but that's not ever what I cared about. But I'll be honest. It is important, my mom was right. When she told me to get that job I didn't like, she's like, you gotta be an adult, you gotta pay your bills, and you know, someday you'll have a family to take care of, and you gotta be responsible. That's all true, but what I'm telling you is you don't have to get a job that is separate from the things you dreamed about doing. You could create a job that does it. And when I said, I'm gonna go pursue my dreams of seeing the world, everybody said, in fact, I'll tell you, I was in a school recently, a middle school, and I told uh, the kids, 
They should pursue the thing, their dreams. And a teacher, you guys are going to kick out of this, a teacher pulled me aside and said, can you please stop telling students to pursue their dreams? It's irresponsible. They should just go get a job. And I was like, wow, you're the teacher? And that's what you're teaching them? It's not irresponsible. You can do both. So when I quit my good paying job that I hated and started a company that enabled me to live the life I want, traveling to different countries, right? I still, my mom kept calling and said, yeah, but can you eat? Can you pay your bills? So that's the only reason I'm telling you this. A lot of money driven person, but three years later, uh, we sold this company for like more than $100 million. Um, I was 20 something years old and unemployed, and then we sold this company. So it turns out I actually could pay my bills um, while I was getting to live the job that I wanted to live. So that's what I want you to understand about entrepreneurship. I would tell people it's not a job, it's a privilege. Right? I get to, my friends would say, oh, I've got to go to work tomorrow. And I'd say, really? Because I get to go to work. I love what I do. I can't wait to go back to the office and do something else again. Because entrepreneurs, I'm going to say it again, get to design the life they want to live and the job they want to have and the company they want to work for. We literally, one day my employees came up and they were asking me the rules of the company. And I was like, it's our company. It's making whatever we want. Things like vacation. I actually said, I'm not going to count vacation days. Because you either get your job done or you're fired anyway. So if you're getting your job done and you take off for the beach on Friday, I don't care, as long as your work is done. And I was like, let's just design the company we always wanted to work for and do it the way we want. It was really cool to get to do that um, with big dreams. And that, by the way, that was the biggest company I was part of. Um, if you guys have seen the TV commercials, uh, you, a lot of you, you're too young to really know a lot about uh, William Shatner, not Captain Kirk. But we have Kaylee Kuko from uh, Big Bang Theory does the commercials too, uh, the blonde on those, and that's Priceline. But now you should be less surprised that I was part of a travel company because I wanted to go see the world. This company we started, this was a startup, an entrepreneurial startup, a little group of people. Uh, this company now does business in 200 countries. And I know it still feels silly to say this, but we started, this company was started from scratch and it's worth $93 billion today. That was actually billion with a B. Um, you can actually pursue your dreams and pay your bills at the same time by creating companies that let you do what you want to do. So, by the way, I told you guys, these are just some pictures of some of the travels. I told you my goal was before I die uh, to visit 50 countries in my life, but because I created travel companies, I was just recently down in Paraguay, and that was country number 92. So I've been to 92 of the 50 countries I wanted to get to before I die, because that's my job, actually. That's what I do for a living, is go to these different countries. So, I want to be clear with you guys though. Entrepreneurship, whatever your interest is, I come out of the tech space, but entrepreneurship is not about tech, right? Entrepreneurs are every different kind in technology, in science. I just went to a, a fashion, an entrepreneur's fashion show, where people who wanted to be in fashion were creating their own fashion companies and new designs. Um, whether it's art or agriculture or anything, whatever your interest is, entrepreneurship still applies to you. In fact, in the entertainment biz, which I'm going to talk about, artists, musicians, are the ultimate entrepreneurs, right? Because somebody's got to market their music, their singing, their look, their brand, find an audience for them, find someone to get their buy their songs. They're the ultimate entrepreneurs. So don't let anyone ever tell you that entrepreneurship is a business thing, but you're in art, right? Or you're in entertainment or whatever. All of those. It's called the music business, right? Show business, the movie business. Entrepreneurship applies to whatever your interest is. Okay, so we just want to make sure, even if you're not in tech, this is, we're still talking to you when we talk about entrepreneurship. Again, what it's all about is having that big dream and then making some plan to achieve it. So, the travel thing worked out pretty good. And I was like, man, I like this formula. Dream a big dream and then start a company in that space that you want to be in. If fashion's your thing, think about starting a fashion company instead of just getting a job in that space. So, oh, that's what I want to tell you. My first experience was, with being an entrepreneur was I wanted to go there. Uh, and I told you I went to this little public school, a big public school, in a little area though that, that people didn't go to schools like that. In fact, when I said I wanted to go there, this is pretty crazy, my guidance counselor didn't want to fill out the forms because she said, people like us don't go to schools like that. I was like, well, not with guidance counselors like you, they don't. And I had have my mom call her and say, would you please fill out the forms so my kid could apply. And I got into that school, that was a big dream. That's the school I wanted to go to, I really hard in high school. I got into the school, I went there, and on the first day I got kicked out. And I was in my first class, and they're like, are you Jeff? And I said, yeah, why? And they said, yeah, man, you didn't pay. 
I said, my family's broke, we're poor. We sent you all the money we have. And they said, it's not enough, you need to go home. And I called my parents, and they said, just come home. And I called my friends, I said, my dream's over. They're kicking me out because I don't have enough money. And they said, just come home. And I remember thinking, at 18 years old, this was my first big obstacle in life, and everybody's advice was quit. And I sat down on the steps and I said, I ain't going home. Somehow, some way, I'm not leaving here without a diploma in my hand. And so, my first startup was the second day of school because I couldn't go to class. I started a little company, it was a software company, which would be fine except I don't know how to write software because they won't let me go to class. Um, but I started one anyway. And I just made handwritten signs and stuck them up at the local high school. I walked over there, said programmers wanted, and there were some kids who knew how to run, write code. And I just hired them and started bidding on jobs. Four years later, I got my degree from Yale. I paid for my entire college by running a little company. As an, but I still didn't call myself an entrepreneur. The lesson I want you to learn from that is when you have a big dream or a big problem to solve, there's a way to do it. No one's going to do it for you. You own your life. It's up to you to design your future. Everybody told me to quit. Everybody told me to come home. And I said, I'm not coming home. I'm going to figure this thing out. I started a business and actually was able to pay for my whole college education that way. But this formula, I was like, this is pretty cool. I want to do it again. So I'm going to share with you a couple of other ones. I'm watching a concert. And I had a concert. And we go to this concert, it's like 30,000 people. The concert at that time happened to be Elton John. A friend of mine had tickets. So we go in there. And the guy comes out on stage, some guy, and he's like, are you ready to rock? And there's like 30,000 people screaming. And he's like, we got Elton John tonight. And everybody's screaming. And I turned to my friend, and I was like, who is that guy? And they said, he's the producer of the concert. This is his show. And I was like, I want to do that, right? Because music, first of all, I love music. It's one of my passions. But that night, when you go to a concert, for one night, everybody's the same. There's no age, there's no race, there's no gender. Everybody's just there together. Everybody was singing new words to every song. And all your problems go away. The whole audience was on its feet the whole night just singing and being together. It was such a cool experience. And I was like, I want to create that. I want to be the concert producer. And there was another time where I saw a uh, tour. It was on TV. And they said, well, we're about to hit the road for you know, 33 uh, cities in 47 days. We're going on tour. And I was like, man, I want to go on the tour bus. And my friend's like, not going to happen. Right? You're not going to be the concert producer. By the way, I'm an engineer. I, my degree was software engineering. So when I told my friends I want to be in music, I want to be on stage or not singing, for putting this together, or on the tour bus, on a tour, everybody said, you're an engineer, it's never going to happen. So I'm going to tell you the formula. Start with a big dream, right? And then what you've got to do is study the industry. So I started studying the music industry. Everything, researching everything, I just started Googling concert production. Produce a concert, every combo. I read everything I could read about how you produce concerts. And here, and I got educated on the concert business. Then I sent emails randomly to concert producers that I don't know, just cold. And most of them won't answer, but one does. You can send out 50 emails and 49 people don't answer you, but one does. And he's like, I remember when I was your age, what do you want to know? I said, teach me about concerts and production. I want to learn the business. And I studied it. And then I started a company doing it. Um, because I said, there's another thing. Before I die, I want to produce at least one concert. And just once, I want to be on the tour bus. Um, so we started this music company because, again, that's what entrepreneurs do. They design their own future. They create companies by studying an industry and figuring out how to be valuable. What can you do in that industry? Okay. By the way, I'll tell you what I did. I wrote down everything. This is what you should do. Study an industry. I wrote down everything it takes to produce a concert. And then all on the board. And then I walked up and I was like, okay, someone has to write the songs, not me. Someone has to sing the songs, not me. Someone has to dance, totally not me. Um, and I, but then like somebody has to finance this. I actually know how to put deals together. And then I wrote, somebody has to market the concert and promote it and advertise it and get people to come. I actually am pretty good at marketing. I studied that, I know how to do that. So you make a list of all the tasks, the problems in an industry. You cross off all the ones you can't do. If there's nothing left, move on. But if there's something you can do, I was like, man, I know how to do marketing and promotions and I know how to put business deals together. So I am going to start this music company because I won't be on stage, I won't music, I won't sing, I won't write it, I won't dance, but I'll put the deals together and I'll put the concerts together. By the way, when I started talking to music artists, I said, what's the problem you need help with in the music business? They said, we're not business people, we're all singers. We don't know how to put a concert together. We don't know how to raise money for it. We don't know how to promote it. We just want to get on stage and sing. We need people to do the business. And I was like, you know, if you think of American Idol, for the 70,000 people, 
at every city that come to auditions, for the one person you see on stage singing, there's a hundred jobs behind that person putting the business together. Right? And I was like, why would I get in that line of 70,000 people when I could be in the music person business by being in the business, uh, in the business side of it? The degree we were talking about at Northwood, the ESM, Entertainment Sports Marketing. I was just talking to a bunch of students at Northwood who are in that, learning the business side of entertainment and of sports. So we started the company. I'll just show you a couple of random pictures. But what was interesting about this night was I just like out of body experience. So I was doing a concert with El John, uh, who uh, turned out wound up becoming a good friend. And we're backstage, and Elvis said, "Are you going to introduce me or not?" And I said, "He said, let's get the show on the road." And I went on stage, and I looked up. And there was thirty thousand people. And I said, are you people ready to rock? And then I was like, oh my god, who am I? Right? I was like, it's out of body. I can see myself. Out of body. I was like, wait, I'm actually on stage doing that thing I said I was going to do. And my friends were up there in the audience. And I was even, it was even crazier because I was saying, I couldn't find a rock band, but a friend of mine plays the piano, so this British guy is going to come out and play a few songs for you. Right? And I'm making fun of Elton John. I'm thinking, what? Me? Really? A kid from this little town with no money, and I'm standing on the stage. I'm standing on the stage because I had a big dream, and then I researched an industry, and I found out a way I could get involved in it. Anything you guys want to do, you can do with that formula. I am not a straight-A student. I was never the smartest one, but I was the one that had big dreams and was willing to do the work. And I put in the time, and I learned the business, and I figured it out. Later, I'll just show you one other one. It's kind of a cool moment. So then I started the tour company, after the concert company. And one day, this picture's embarrassing. I'm going to admit it now. Uh, but we did a sync, and we did Britney Spears and Backstreet. We did a Beyonce tour, we did Nelly. I was doing touring on uh, those years. So that night, I was on tour with NSYNC. That's Justin Timberlake standing right behind me. He had a hat on because he had fresh cornrows in that day before they went on stage. But we were in Pittsburgh, I remember this night. Uh, we were at Heinz Stadium, where the Steelers played. 70,000 NSYNC at that time, whether you liked them or not, they were the biggest band in the world. They were the biggest selling band on the planet Earth at that moment. So we were playing Heinz Stadium. 70,000 screaming fans. Well, screaming girls, mostly. Um, and I remember I went under the stadium. The boys wanted to see what it's like to be the Steelers running into the stadium. So we're standing under the people. Like, they're all looking at the stage. If they look down, they'd see the standing. But we were standing right there. And I turned to Justin Timberlake, and I said this. I said, did you ever, in your wildest dreams, imagine that you'd be standing right here, right now, Football stadium, 70,000 people, sold out two nights in a row. And Justin goes, hey, Jeff. And I said, what? And he goes, did you ever in your dreams imagine you'd be the dude just standing here with us on this tour? And I was like, kind of, yeah. That was the plan, right? There's nothing stopping you from designing your own future and your own life. Um, this uh, was kind of a cool moment, but uh, two years ago, I won a Grammy. Uh, and I'm standing there on the Grammy red carpet. We produced an album. Uh, that won a Grammy, and I'm standing there, and then what you can see, I'm, I'm getting in trouble. I was taking pictures of all the paparazzi, they're all taking pictures of me, and they're all yelling at me, you can't take pictures, we do. And I was like, well, apparently I can, because I'm digging them right now. Uh, but if somebody yelled to me, they said, uh, how does this feel? And we not only getting nominated, but then we won uh, the Grammy. And I said, this is the dream of software engineers everywhere. And they're like, what? And everyone's like, man, you're killing the vibe, just shut up. But it was kind of my inside joke. Right? It doesn't no, let nothing limit you. People kept telling me you're a software engineer, you can't do the music bits. You're a learner. You're a human being. You can learn anything that you set out to learn if you're willing to put in the time. And that was my lesson. I, after that, I said, before I die, I want to make a movie. Right? I just, it'll probably fail. I just want to go out to Hollywood and make a movie. Uh, just once in my life. And I took the same formula. I'm just going to go study the industry, right? And, and see if I can do it. And all my friends, same thing. Right, you're an engineer, you don't know anything about movies. I already told you the formula. Start with a big dream. Study that business. I read every book, every article, everything I could read about movie production. I randomly sent emails to people in the movie business. Every once in a while, somebody would answer. By the time I was done, I did what I told you. I made a list of all the things you have to do to make a movie. And at the end, I crossed off all the ones I didn't know how to do. I'm not going to act. I can't operate a camera. I don't know what a grip or a best boy or a gaffer is, but they're all in the credits at the end of the movie. Think about it. For two people that you see in a movie, actors, look at the credits at the end of a movie. All those are business, a lot of those are business people. All those people making movies, I said, I can do a bunch of stuff, they do. So we started the company. Now, <clears throat> if you did see this movie, you should deny it. I'm just going to show you our first movie. Um, <clears throat> but we, I went out, we started the company by studying it. 
<clears throat> that's the first movie we made. It's a scary movie. We made it years ago. It's still on Netflix and Showtime and all that stuff now. Uh, but we made this movie. They kill me in every one of the scary movies now. Uh, so that's me. I don't know if you can tell. I'm actually bleeding right before I die in the movie. It's just a fun movie. But anyway, uh, we went out, and you know, my friends is kind of the same thing. They're like, man, you're an engineer. You can't just be in the movie business. You're right, unless you do everything I just told you. Unless you really want to do that. Unless you study it. Unless you figure out what problems you can solve and where you can contribute. And in the end, I was able to do that. The goal is you need to become valuable to the people you want to be around. You want to be the person that people start calling and saying, can you help me with this movie? When I learned all those skills, people started calling me. We made this first little movie, Cabin Fever. We wrote it, we shot it, we directed it, produced it. Me and my friends are all in it. That's how bad it is. We made our own, this movie. And in the end, this movie, uh, again, we made this movie for about $1.2 million. But because I know how to sell stuff, I don't know how to act. I don't know how to operate a camera. But I'm a marketing guy. So I did all the marketing for our own film. And in the end, our movie sold in 46 different countries. We made it for a million bucks, and it made like $98 million in theaters because we know how to do marketing. There is nothing you can't do if you're willing to study it. I'll show you the last one, what I'm doing now. I just announced this two weeks ago. Um, I love sports, and I took the same formula. And I was like, I'm going to go study the business side of sports. I'm never going to be on the field. I'm never going to play. Right? In high school, well, I played a little bit of football in college, and that was the end of it. Um, Sports isn't it, but I love being around it. I love being around the people. What is the formula again, guys? Go learn enough to be valuable to the people you want to be around. By the way, I'll tell you the music biz. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was out in LA, and I got a call, and I wound up, I was uh, sitting at Christina Aguilera's house. And she called and said, will you come over? And I was sitting there, she's making me dinner. I was like, what on earth am I doing here? And she said, I got a business idea. You know, she quit the voice. And, and it's really touring, and now she wants to be an entrepreneur. She said, I got a business idea, and everyone says, you're the guy that knows this stuff. You want to be the guy or the girl that people call, right? After that, when I was flying back, I got a call from Pitbull, and he's like, can you come visit me, because I got an idea I need to share with you. I was like, why are you calling me? Like, you're the famous singer, I'm just some business guy. He said, you're the business guy that knows how to do the stuff, I don't, but you come sit down with me. That's your opportunity. Learn how to solve a problem in whatever business you want to be in. If it's medicine, if it's healthcare, if it's fashion, become the person that everybody wants to call by, by solving problems, by studying the industry, by saying, what can I do that would be of value to people? You don't have to get a job, you can make one. So I did that in sports business, we studied it, and last year, I don't know if you're baseball fans, uh, but that's a friend of mine, Derek Jeter. Derek retired from the Yankees last year, and we did a deal together to buy a baseball team. And all of a sudden, Derek called me and said, why are you calling me? Right? This is a five-time World Series champion. And he said, because I want to buy a baseball team, and I don't know the business side, and I know that you know it. You're the go-to guy. Will you help me? And we put a deal together to buy the Miami Marlins. And now, we've been looking at, last week, we just announced our newest company. Uh, we launched a new company to buy sports teams. Uh, and I've been learning from, the other cool part is, uh, you know, I made new friends. Whatever, like I said, if fashion's your industry, you want to be the person, you want to hang out with people in fashion. You want to hang out with the innovators and the leaders. You have to be valuable to them. You have to learn enough that they want to call you. So now, you know, uh, that's, you know that's Charles Barker. And uh, Charles and I do a lot of stuff in basketball. And this is my partner in the football company. We are in the process right now. We're about to buy an NFL football team. Uh, that guy's name is Ray Lewis. He played for the Baltimore Ravens for a lot of years. But Ray and I are looking at NFL teams to buy a team. We created our future. I would love someday to own an NFL football team. None of that stuff just happens. I had to study the business. I had to be brave enough to email and ask people questions and find people. But there is nothing you can't do. By the way, you know why most people won't do it? Because of fear. People say, well, you can't just start a movie company. Well, not with that attitude. You can't. You can do anything you want if you give yourself a chance. And by the way, the worst thing in life is not failing. The worst thing in life is not trying. If you think you could start a music company, as an example, or be in fashion, and you never try, you will spend your whole life seeing people in fashion on TV and saying, man, that could have been me, and wondering. That's hard to live with, right? If you try and you fail, I failed a lot of times. I'm not sharing those with you, but I've had plenty of failures, right? When you fail, you can get up and you say, I guess music isn't for me, but you can live with it because you can get over it. If you never try, you'll spend your whole life wondering what you could have been. So don't be afraid of failing. Be afraid of not trying stuff. I have never been afraid to fail. I've tried all kinds of stuff. So what's the key to being a successful entrepreneur? It's that. 
Here's what I told you. Start with big dream. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. When I was a kid, even in school, every dream I had, one day I'm going to make a movie. Yeah, right. Everybody, everybody told me no. Right? One, I never said we were going to win a Grammy, but one day I'm going to go on a concert tour. One day, every one of these one days, everybody I ever told just laughed at me. My whole life. And by the way, in my case, I've included my parents. Nobody ever believed any of it. Here's what I want to tell you. If nobody believes in it but you, that's still enough. I believed I could do all these things. So I just kept on going and trying it. Because again, failure is not what scared me. Spending my whole life being afraid to try is what scared me. If you're the only one that believes in your dreams, it's still enough. But you're going to start with a big dream. If you have a small dream and you achieve 100% of it, you didn't do much. If you have a big dream and you don't get all the way there, I'll tell you what, in the worst case, you've got a story to tell to the person that sort of never left their safety of their desk, which was some of my friends. I'm not judging them, but they never moved. And I was out there, and even when I failed, I remember one time, figuratively, Right? We failed, so it's like we're laying there in a pile of bloody wreckage. Everything failed around us. And I turned to my friends and I was like, I swear one day this is going to be a funny story. And they're like, yo, right now we just want to cry. I said, I know we failed, everyone's laughing at us, but today, well, someday this will be a good story. Having a good story and adventure, being out living life, is still better than not trying. It's still better than sitting on the couch. I have this reminder in my office, it's a slide, it's, it's a picture that just says, get off the couch. Because I have some friends that every Friday night are sitting on the same couch saying, this time I'm really going to chase my dream. This time I'm really going to quit the job I hate. They never leave the couch. They never do anything. Don't be that person. Get off the couch, go out in the world and try and fail. Right? Nothing wrong with failing. In fact, if you never fail, it's just because you're not trying that hard. I was trying to make that example to a group of kids I was talking with. And the guy I brought me, I don't know if any of you were ever or are ever skateboarders, but I brought Tony Hawk with me. And Tony is like the only guy that had ever, the trick he did was a 720 in competition that no one had ever done before. And I have Tony sitting here and I said, so the first time you got on your board and tried the 720, you nailed it, right? And he said, what? I said, you just nailed it the first time you tried. He said, Jeff, I went to the hospital 11 times and broke nine bones working on that trick. He said, my mom kept begging me to quit skating every time she took me to the hospital. He's like, I didn't just get on and try it. He said, I failed and I broke bones and I went to the hospital and I failed again. I said, amazing, huh? Because that's what it's all, that's what trying is about. If you want to do something great with your life, accept the fact that you're going to fall and break bones. Literally, maybe, figuratively, definitely. A failure is just part of the process. But it's not how many times you fall, guys. It's how many times you get back up and say, I'm going to keep trying. Because everybody else that wasn't Tony Hawk was afraid to ever even try that thing. Um, you're willing to take risks and to take chances, study an industry, and like I said, become valuable. Solve a problem. Figure out what you could do. What job could you do in that industry? Like I told you, when you see a movie at the end, you see how many names are in the credits? Don't tell me there's not one, there's one of those things you could do. There's some role you can play in any industry that you want to be in to get you into the industry. And the last thing I want to share with you guys is this. People sometimes say to me, well, then why do I need to go to school? Especially because I started internet companies. Um, and, uh, you know, our internet company and internet companies, as I said, a couple of them became worth billions of dollars. So people say, why don't I need to go to school? Why don't I just start an internet company or whatever it is that you want to do? And here's the part that they're missing. The reason that I was able, as an engineer, to do an engineering company, then a music company, go into the arts, then film, then into sports or whatever, is because I learned how to learn. When, you, when you're in your class and you're thinking, why do I need to know this? You're missing the point. The things they're teaching you here are not the thing, meaning that I was thinking once in math, right? It turns out, I'll tell you the truth, nobody has ever driven to my office, pulled into the parking lot, walked in and said, how much does it cost for you to compute the square root of a number for me? I was like, oh, I learned how to do that in school. It turns out no one ever has asked me to compute a square root of a number ever again. So I was thinking, why do I need to know how to do square roots? Because it's not the thing, it's the method of learning. What you are learning, I think I have this, what you are learning, math teaches you problem solving. My engineering classes taught me critical thinking. My English teacher taught me how to write. My history teacher taught me how to do research. So you know what happened when I got out in the world? I said, I want to be in the music industry. So you know what I had to do? I had to research, like I did in history class, and research the business. Then I had to write a proposal. How did I ever get to somebody like Elton John? I had to have good writing skills and communication skills, which I learned in my English class. Then I had to analytically think through the problems which I learned how to do in math. Then I had sometimes things weren't going well. And I do need to sit there and say, man, I just don't know what to do next. But physics taught me structured thinking. 
and problem solving and analytical thinking and critical thinking. My art classes taught me creativity when it was time to design things. You are learning how to learn, right? The more you learn how to learn, the better learner you are, the better you'll be able to do anything you want to do. So the only reason I was able to do all that stuff is one, I love learning, and two, I paid attention and how to learn. I actually know how to do research and problem solving and writing and all those things because I learned in school. I just wanted to share that with you because that's why you're here and that's what you're going to learn. And by the way, networks and teamwork and everything else, right? I learned how to work with people in a lot of school projects. So when it was time, when I was 20 something years old and I was going to start my own company, I had a pretty good idea how to build teams. By the way, high school sports taught me a lot about teamwork and commitment and organization. My coach taught me a lot of life lessons, uh, which is why I relate to sports so much. But every team I was part of, whether that's a team, I actually was telling Justin this earlier, I got, when I walked in here, one of my teachers made me do a theater production. I wasn't interested in theater. And she made me do a stage production and be part of it on stage. But I learned so much about production that later I remembered all that stuff. Everything you learn contributes to your ability to go out in the world and create something that other people can't because they don't have the breadth of skills. I am an engineer, but I also do music, right? Uh, you know, ultimately when we got that Grammy, that kind of proved that we knew something about music. I learned the film business, I learned the sports business. I'm just a good learner. So I'm gonna stop there. I hope that this, uh, by the way, my email's on there. If you guys ever wanna ask a question, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. This is why I do this, but I just wanna leave you with that. You own your future. Don't let anybody tell you what you can or can't do. Be willing, be brave enough to actually try. Uh, don't let anybody talk about a big dream. Like I said, my first one was I was going to visit 50 countries in my whole life, and hopefully my life is not yet close to over, and I'm up to 90 of them. But if I had listened to everybody that told me no, everyone that told me you're not smart enough, it's too hard, you can't do it, you're an engineer, you don't know music, I didn't listen to no. What I said was, I'm going to just try anyway. And if I fail, you're right. By the way, part of failure is you do get laughed at. People made fun of me every time I felt, oh, you think you're so smart. I thought this would, you got to shake that off, man, because in the end, in the end, in fact, I'm going to tell you, all the people that didn't believe in you show up again, um, <laughs> no matter what happens. And they don't remember that they don't believe in you. And I have a friend uh, who's, uh, he hasn't been relevant in your guys' time period, who's a rapper, and he wrote, I'm not going to rap, I promise. But I am going to repeat the line, because we have a discussion about this, and he put it in a song that even when no one believes in you, those people all come back again when you pull it off. And, and I don't know what kind of music you guys listen to, but uh, my friend is Nelly. If you know Hot in Here or any Nelly song. Nelly and I were talking about this, and Nelly actually wrote a rap line to talk about the fact that no one believes in you until you make it. And then they show up and none of them try it. If you don't know this, this is going to be horrible because I'm going to say it, not rap it. But Nelly had this line that says, so many people straight doubted my flow. They said that I was a failure. Now the same people all asked for dough, and I'm saying I can't help you. Have you ever heard this line? And they say, hey, can we get some tickets to the next show? And Nelly says, you for real? It's in a song. He wrote about the fact that no one believed he could succeed in the music business, and now they all call him and ask for tickets every time he has a show. Don't listen to the negative, don't listen to the naysayers. In my case, I hate to say this, and I hope you're better, my parents didn't believe I could do any of it. And I love them dearly, but I learned to say, thank you, Mom, that's nice, Mom, and I listened to her, but I never stopped. I was like, you know what, Mom, I'd rather fail and shake it off than I would never try because I'm the free dude. Thank you guys very much for having me. like a three episode appearance next season. So uh, the role is not one of the sharks, it's the mentor. They want to add a new role where somebody represents the, uh, the entrepreneurs and argues with the sharks. But like Mark Cuban, Damon John, I've known those guys for a long time. So they want me to come in when, when somebody like Cuban says, that's a dumb idea, I'm going to come out of the curtain and I'm going to say, no, maybe you're just not smart enough to understand it. They want someone <laughs> to fight the sharks. So that won't be
me till next season, and I'm, we're going to try it for three episodes and see how it works. So you probably will see me. I probably will do that. Someone had a question over here. So I'll tell you what, both, uh, because most programs have, you could be studying both of those things. I uh, uh, met a lot of the Northwood kids today that were having, that were doing double degrees, double majors or double minors, uh, so that they could study all of the above. So you can study both, you can study engineering and entrepreneurship, but even if you only pick one, let me tell you what, you don't lose either way because you can't build a company by yourself. You can start it, but you're gonna need a team. So whichever one you pick, find someone that knows the other one. If you pick entrepreneurship and you're business focused, then find an engineer if your product's technical. If you pick engineering, that's fine, then go find a business, an entrepreneurship major to help you with the business. You're gonna need a team, right? And you're gonna have to build people around you. Every one of those companies only works because I went and found people smarter than me in every area, and I talked them into helping me out and to join them. So you can't lose either way. You'll just have to find someone that knows the stuff you know. Anybody else? Yeah. Would you say patience and perseverance are essential? Okay, the question was, are patience and perseverance essential? I'm laughing because I have no patience, and I've been told that my entire life by my mother. Um, so patience a little bit, but it's funny because people used to tell me, when I worked at my big corporate job, my boss said, you have a fundamental character flaw. And I said, what? And he said, you're the most impatient person I've ever met. And he said, you just need to calm down. The uh, gentleman is an entrepreneur. Some guy said, you're going to be really good at this. And I said, why? And he said, you have natural drive. I was like, really? Because yesterday was impatience. So natural drive is when people say, next week we should. And I always say, why don't we just do that right now? So the opposite of patience, I won't say impatience, but the opposite of impatience is an important trait. Anytime someone says, we can do that tomorrow, I say, wait, first, can we do it right now? And so our companies, by the way, somebody said to me once, man, you built a lot of companies. I thought you were going to be 90 years old when I met you. You know why? Because we don't waste much time, right? That was the just-in-time thing we were just talking about. There's a Japanese business strategy called just-in-time that says get it done when you need to get it done. So pers persistence, absolutely. Um, uh, patience, only a little bit. Too much patience, you can't be an entrepreneur. Because if you wait too long, some big company will do it. Right? Entrepreneurs, we've got to get stuff done before they think of it. Right? Think about those first thing I showed you, those kiosks that are in all the airports right now in the world. Um, if I had gone slowly, the airlines would have eventually figured that out, wouldn't they? It's not rocket science, it's a printer. You've seen my product in the airport. An airline would have figured that out if I went slow. By the time the airlines figured it out, I'd already designed it, built it, patented it, and tested it. And they're like, wow, that's a good idea. I said, well, just, it's already done, take it. And they said, you're right, why would we start from scratch, we'll buy it. So pay, don't have too much patience. Um, get stuff done. Who else? Anybody else have? Yes. You mentioned that you love your parents a lot, um, but they didn't always inspire you to uh, to look farther, I guess. Um, was there anyone in the field of entrepreneuring uh, that you looked up to? Yes. Yeah, so let me, instead of naming names, let me tell you this. Um, in the, in what's really, really helpful for your whole life, personally and professionally, is a mentor. Finding a mentor. And what I realized was I didn't know anybody. My parents came from different backgrounds. There was no one I knew in my family or friends that was the right mentor for me. So I'm going to tell you how to pick one. Um, find somebody, this is what I learned a lot later, find somebody in the world, even if you don't know them, that you want your life to be like. Who do you, find somebody you say, man, I'm going to be like her when I grow up, and reach out to that person. I, I finally did that one day. I was like, no one in my life understands me, no one believes me, and they keep calling, telling me you're such a dreamer, you're going to fail at everything. And my parents were like, maybe everyone's right. They were just trying to protect me, I get that. But there was a guy in the business community, not a famous person, uh, but there was someone I'd read about, his name was Roger. And I was like, man, I want to be him when I grow up. So one day I just, out of the blue, wrote an email to him. And then I wrote another one, and another one, and another one, because he didn't answer any of them. And then one day his assistant called and said, here's the deal. She said, Roger said he'll give you 20 minutes downstairs for coffee under one condition. And I said, what? And he said, never call us again. <laughs> and I said, I'll take the 20 minutes. And I went for 20 minutes. It lasted three hours. Uh, and he was my mentor. And I never met this guy. I just basically went to him. And after three hours, he said, man, you remind me of me when I was your age. Find somebody in the world 
that inspires you, that you want to be like when you grow up, reach out to that person and ask them to be your mentor. When I found that mentor, everything changed because I finally had someone that said, you're not a big dreamer, you're not an idiot, try it. And he supported me and he got me, and my own parents didn't. Uh, find somebody like that. 